Hello, I'm Wayne Shou from, um, from uh, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle. We are all familiar with Darwin's survival of the fittest. Today I want to discuss the survival of the most cooperative. I want to show you how um, cooperators, individuals that pay up cost to help others might end up being more fit than selfish individuals. What is cooperation? I will use example to illustrate. To digest extracellular proteins, a cooperator cannot pay a cost to manufacture proteases which are released into the environment, which digest proteins into amino acids. Some of these amino acids are consumed by cooperators. Others are simply lost into the environment. And some might be taken up by neighboring cells. If a neighboring individual is also a cooperator, it can um, also make proteases which liberate more amino acids, some of which can be reciprocated back to the original cooperator. So cooperation is profitable when reciprocated. And this kind of cooperation um, between individuals of the same population via the production and sharing of the same benefit is defined as homotypic cooperation. Cooperation co can also occur between two different populations, each synthesizing a benefit, a distinct benefit to benefit to the partner. And I define this as heterotypic cooperation. And I intentionally use different shapes to indicate these two different populations. However, cooperators can mutate um, to cheaters. Cheaters pay no cost and supply no benefit. And I intentionally use um, open symbols to uh, re reflect the fact that they have nothing to offer. And um, so for, uh, in heterotypic cooperation, of course, both populations can give birth to um, cheaters. Without a loss of generality, I, just, I would just consider cheater variants of this type of cooperators. And I'll call this cheater, cooperator, and cooperative partner shorthanded as partner. Because cheater, uh, cheaters do not pay a cost, but exploit um, cooperative benefit, they're expected to be more fit than cooperators. That is, um, they should divide more frequently than cooperators, and their frequencies should increase um, as a function of time. So eventually, cheaters should crash the cooperative system. Um, example of, of um, ch uh, cooperation cheating is um, cancers can be regarded as um, cheaters of cooperative multicellularity. So this begs the question, how does cooperation survive cheaters? Decades of experimental theoretical research have revealed two fundamental mechanisms that can stabilize cooperation. If a cooperative individual can recognize another cooperative individual and preferentially interact um, with that and exclude cheaters, then cooperation may be stabilized. A spatially structured environment can also stabilize cooperation. And how that works for homotypic cooperation is, um, uh, is easy to understand. One can imagine, um, because of the uh, limited migration in a spatially structured environment, an individual is clustered with its offsprings. So this allows the cooperators to preferentially interact with each other, and, uh, um, and, uh, um, and this favors cooperation. And how a spatially structured environment might stabilize heterotypic cooperation is less apparent. Clustering with offspring seem to still grant cooperators, cheaters, equal access to partners. And because cooperators pay a cost um, to reciprocate, but cheaters do not, it would seem like cheaters should be more advantageous than cooperators. And this is contrary to experimental findings. So we want to understand how, um, how a spatially structured environment might protect heterotypical cooperation. And Babak Momeni, a postdoctoral fellow, um, decided to address this question using an engineered yeast um, system. The engineered yeast cooperative and cheating system consists of um, two, uh, three strains. Um, the blue fluorescent strain cannot make lysine, and I call this L minus. A red fluorescent st uh, strain cannot make lysine and overproduce uh, adenine, and I call this L minus A plus. A third strain cannot make adenine and overproduce lysine. Uh, it is green fluorescent. So if we, uh, we have these three types of cells, if we grow them you know, on, uh, on top of a petri dish, which represents a spatially structured environment, and if we supply adenine and lysine in the medium, then three types of cells will um, compete for shared resources. But if the environment uh, has no adenine or lysine supplements, then these three types of cells, um, in addition to, corp uh, to competition, they will also engage in co uh, comp uh, cooperation and cheating. The partner cells would release lysine to both cooperators and cheaters. The cooperators will reciprocate with adenine, but the cheaters will not. The advantage of using an engineered system is that we completely get away from the potential recognition mechanisms that might have evolved in natural systems. 
So now we want to see whether this, um, this heterotypical cooperation tuning systems could be stabilized in a, a spatially structured environment. So we mix the three types of cells at one to one to one and place them on a, a agar pad. And we allow the community to grow to, um, for, uh, ten, uh, for, for about 10 generations. And we look at the ratio of cooperator to cheater at the end of the growth. And if the environment has um, adding lysine such that the three strains um, engage in competition, what we see that cooperator is disfavored. And that actually suggests that adding overproduction by cooperators incurs a fitness cost. Now, if the environment has no adding or lysine so that the three strains engage in cooperation cheating, what we see is that cooperator is favored over cheaters. And if we periodically disrupt the spatial environment by mixing the cells, we do not see this result. So, so it indicates that uh, um, spatial, somehow spatial self-organization is responsible for, um, uh, uh, for um, helping cooperators. So how might this work? So we constructed a mathematical uh, model, a spatial model. So in this model, we consider three populations. We consider nutrient release and diffusion uh, around the cooperators, but not cheaters. And then the second process is nutrient consumption. And that consumption, um, the rate of consumption depends on the local concentration of the metabolites that the cells need. And this consumption then leads to cell division. Uh, and the difference is that the cheaters would consume the metabolites faster and divide more frequently than cooperators. And then we have stochastic death events. And now the third um, process is cell rearrangement in a three-dimensional uh, community. So we want to understand how cells might rearrange. So imagine your focal cell sitting here, and you're looking around at the X, Y, the top view, the coplanar um, um, neighborhood, and how might you send your daughter um, to, um, to other places? So to uh, understand how this rearrangement might happen, we look at, at the, a single um, yeast cell, fluorescent yeast cell, and see how microcolonies might form. So we, we, first we see the microcolonies grow, um, grow and, then, um, and most of the um, other layers of cells are actually dim. But the center ones become, um, become bright. Once the, um, once the radius of the mi uh, microcon exceeds four, cell, uh, four cells. And those bright spots is because of the um, cells growing to the uh, upper layer. And then we define this as confinement in the neighborhood. And then as the, the microcon grows larger, um, uh, then you can, again you can see that, you can see that the, uh, the edge remains monolayer, but the center ones become more, uh, the, the brighter region becomes more uh, obvious. So to incorporate that, we define this um, four cell radius as a confinement in the neighborhood. So if it's not filled, then this focal budding cell would send its daughter cell along the shortest path to the nearest uh, open spot. So now if the, uh, um, if the confinement in the neighborhood is completely filled, so now we're looking at the vertical cross section now. This focal cell, it looks around, and all the uh, locations in the confinement in the neighborhood has been filled. So what it does is it will divide and send all cells above it one level up. And if this focal cell happens to divide randomly, and if it happens to divide that way, it would just fall down and then fill the void. So it's a very simple rule, so we incorporate them, um, these assumptions into this um, spatial model. And uh, um, so we have agros and we have communities. And we, um, so we, we use two, uh, two different scales. So um, for the, we use a very fine, uh, five micron grid um, s s um, scale for, um, to monitor to monitor and death. The five micron is basically the size of a yeast cell. And because the birth and death is slow, we use a, um, a minute um, updating time. Uh, in contrast, the nutrient distribution um, is, um, uh, should be updated very fast because the diffusion is fast over this land scale. And we use a much bigger, um, uh, much bigger uh, spatial um, yeah. Sorry. No Sorry, I didn't even realize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and this, the choice of uh, the choice of different um, spatial and the time and scales uh, is based on the trade-off between accuracy and, uh, and and the computational speed. And even with this kind of optimization, it's still very um, time-consuming. Takes about a week to carry out a simulation like this of to ten, uh, tens of millions of cells. And I want to mention that the parameters in the model um, are experimentally measured, and these include metabolite release rates, metabolite diffusion uh, coefficients, um, metabolite required to make a new cell, and rate of cell birth at a variety of concentrations of metabolite, uh, of co metabolite concentrations, and rate of cell death. So, um, so basically, we put three types of cells on agar, uh, agarose pad, and we do both um, simulations and experiments. We want to uh, look at the three-dimensional organization. We can either look at top view, marked with X, Y, or vertical cross-section, marked with Z. 
So explicitly mark all results with uh, simulations or experiments. And those are not marked. You may choose to not believe them. It's just my imagination, I guess. So now I will compare um, simulation experimental results um, in competition uh, in competitive communities. So we'll see that each cell would grow uh, as a microcolony, and it will expand until they touch, uh, the microcolonies touch each other. At this point, they cannot push other cells around anymore, so they, the only option is to grow upward. The top views don't change, and if you look at the vertical cross-sections, you see, um, see um, blue, green, red um, columns. Now, if we put these three types of cells so on, a, on, a com uh, on corp allow them, force them to cooperate to cheat, then what we've, we found is something very dramatically different. We see that the, uh, the green and the red cooperative partners um, seem to grow together, and the blue cheater seems to be spatially segregated. And this pattern becomes even more, uh, more obvious as, um, as time goes on. And if we look at cross sections, we see that the, um, the green red forms um, uh, intermix, they form this, uh, they grow tall, and the cheaters, the blue cheaters, are relegated to the foothill, and they fail to grow, um, grow, um, grow uh, well. And so it seems like there's differential partner association um, between cooperators and cheaters. So we want to quantify that. Um, so, um, so we devise a very simple metric. We simply count the nearest um, partner neighbor, uh, neighbors around the cooperator and the nearest partner neighbors around the cheater. And we divide these two numbers. And we define that as partner association index. And that is the average number of part, uh, partner neighbors per cooperators divided by that um, per cheaters. And if we get a value of one, that indicates it's um, equal partner association. If it's greater than one, that implies that cooperator has more association with cooperative partners than cheaters do. And then now we look at experimental results. And uh, so in competitive environments, we see an uh, association index um, near one. So that indicates the no preferential association. However, when uh, cells cooperate and cheat, we see um, a value um, significantly greater than one. That suggests that cooperators have more, on average, more partner neighbors than cheaters do. And this I define as, um, this is self-organization, right? The generation of order from, uh, uh, from randomness. So to summarize this part of the talk, I would like to present uh, you um, a conceptual f a model that summarizes all the results I've told you so far. So to um, a simplify illustration, let's imagine um, the center partners are flanked on one side by cooperators and the other side by cheaters. Because um, benefits are lo spatially localized, those cells that are near, uh, more near partners would mo be more likely to divide than those cells farther away from the partner. Now, a cell that um, happens to divide toward partner will have more chance to divide later compared to cells that happen to divide away from the partner. So this will lead to a piling over of cooperators and cheaters over, uh, over the partner. And because cooperators um, uh, reciprocate but cheaters uh, do not, we have this uh, we, uh, the, the partners near cooperators will grow better than the partners near the cheaters. Now, if we have the partner cell, uh, again, uh, the partner cells that divide toward cooperators will have a higher chance to um, divide again compared to a partner that happens to divide away from uh, cooperators. And this will lead to the piling over of the partner over cooperators. But this process will not happen um, with cheaters because cheaters supply nothing. And then um, the same process repeats itself. We see this intermixed pattern between cooperative partners and isolation and disfavoring of cheaters. So now we might ask, well, so given that the yeast system does not have recognition um, mechanisms, and if we destroy spatial um, self-organization, would cheaters always win the game? So Adam Waits, uh, a former graduate student in the lab, uh, uh, carried out experiments to address that question. The expectation is that because cheaters uh, have a 2% fitness advantage, that's experimentally measured, a 2% fitness advantage over cooperators, um, you would imagine that if you mix the three types of cells at one to one to one in a well-mixed environment, so to destroy spatial self-organization, and you just um, grow to moderate density so that nothing else is limiting, and then we keep pros, uh, propagating those co-cultures. Uh, so eventually what we expect is that with a 2% fitness advantage, the cheater to cooperator ratio should double every 50 generations. And this will eventually lead to destruction of cooperation. So we tested this by, um, by growing replicates exactly through this protocol. And plotted here is the number of generations uh, against time. So exponential growth, you should see a linear, a straight, lin uh, a straight line. But instead, we see something very um, heterogeneous. And in fact, if we quantify the growth rates uh, for the last 100 hours or so, we can clearly see they segregated into two groups. So the fast-growing group in orange and the slow-growing group in gray. Even though we expected that the cheater to cooperator ratio should go to two at the, by generation 50, when we quantified the ratio in the slow-growing co-cultures, the ratio exceeded 100. 
So that implies a highly fit Tudor variant has taken over the community. And for these fast-growing cold cultures, actually cooperators are winning up hand. They are numerically much more dominant than Tudors, suggesting that the, a highly fit cooperator um, variant has, um, has risen to high frequency. To test that hypothesis, we um, took slow-growing and fast-growing cold cultures. We, um, isolated cooperator Tudor variants and subjected them to whole genome sequencing, which is very easy now with the revolution sequencing technology. So we could find, um, we find that regardless of whether it's cooperator or Tudor, whether it's from a slow growing or fast growing community, they harbored at least one of these um, mutations in at least one of these genes, ECM21, RSP5, DOA4, and BRO1. So when we look up the literature, it becomes really clear um, how the whole thing uh, works. So the yeast expresses uh, many surface um, permeases, including the high affinity lysine permease LIP1. Under stressful conditions, ECM21 would recruit E3 ubiquitin ligase RSP5 to LIP1, and in conjunction with E2 will attach a polyubiquitin chain to uh, LIP1. And the ubiquitin in LIP1 will be internalized, and the um, DOA4 and BRO1 would mediate the recycling of the ubiquitin chain. So this vesicle will then fuse with the vacuole. Uh, where lip one would be um, degraded, and these amino acids are then released into the cytosol to, um, to help cells to cope with stressful uh, conditions. In involved cells, mutations, a loss of uh, reduction of function or loss of function mutations in these um, genes would mean stabilization of lip one, which would mean the cells would be much better at taking up lysine under limiting concentrations of lysine. <coughs> so to see whether that is the case, we carried out a, a microscopy assay to measure growth rate against uh, um, against the various concentrations of lysine. So the black is the ancestor, and the, the color, the different colors are um, evolved uh, clones. So I want to draw your attention to, um, uh, to four points. So first is that under low concentrations of lysines, uh, evolved clones are much more fit than ancestor. But this, uh, the second point is that this, uh, this, um, the evolved cells have a fitness uh, trade-off at higher concentrations of lysine. They're kept, at, so they're not as fit as the ancestor in that, uh, in that regard. And, uh, um, and it's, Oh, sorry, third. So, and then uh, I also want to uh, point out the fact that, um, that the third fact is that these three, um, those various clones, they differ in their fitness, right? So if we look at this concentration, we can see that right, the red, green are more uh, fit than the blue. So these clones have different fitness at the um, low concentration of lysine. And the fourth point is that the difference between these fitness is far bigger than the advantage of uh, cheaters over cooperators. So now I will put, again, I will present a conceptual um, model to, po I mean, to summarize this part of my talk. Right, so, so, in, so we have cooperator children populations. They will continuously generate mutations that uh, would be adaptive on the lysine limitations. But under ordinary conditions, when lysine is excessive, these mutations will be selected against because of the fitness trade-off I just showed you. And I will use those black circles to um, indicate the mutations that they would have been fit if those would, have, would be subjected to lysine limited co-cultural environment. So now if we switch those cells to a community environment under lysine limitation, so those previously um, um, not fit mutations would rise to a uh, high frequency. And uh, um, sometimes the, ch uh, the cheater, um, in some co-cultures, so the cheater population would happen to sample the most fit um, adaptive mutations. And in, um, in uh, um, some other co-cultures, the cooperators would happen to um, sample the most fit mutations. But the symmetry breaks uh, right at this point, right? If cheaters sample the best mutations, they will rise to high frequency and that's self-destructive. If cooperators sample the best mutations, they would purge cheaters and continue to proliferate. And in fact, we can do a very simple mathematical model of this process and the, the simulation was, uh, could re um, recapitulate um, the experimental or they observed uh, bimodal distribution of, um, of growth rates of co-cultures. But then you said, well, then you might argue, well, this still doesn't help cooperators that much because these evolved cooperators can mutate to cheaters, right? And now you're faced with an uh, 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 adversary who's um, as good as adapting to lysine limitation as you, um, as you are. So what happens? So experimentally, we observed that this process can happen again. So they can sample further mutations to engage in this stochastic, um, stochastic process. But then eventually you would imagine that after round and round of this adaptive race between cooperators and cheaters, you would exhaust adaptive mutations that would help cooperators to, um, to overcome cheaters' fitness advantage. But we argue that many different environmental insults, such as changes in temperature, changes in salinity, the presence of antibiotics, could trigger new rounds of, um, new rounds of uh, adaptive race that would help, um, uh, help cooperators to avoid the deterministic de demise caused by cheaters. 
So now to summarize my entire talk, I have told you um, two mechanisms that could stabilize co heterotypic cooperation against um, cheating, spatial self-organization and the stress-induced uh, adaptive race. Um, and uh, these mechanisms do not rec uh, require recognition, but they will buy cooperators um, time to evolve sophisticated recognition uh, mechanisms. So with this, I would like to thank my uh, funding agency and uh, I, still, I still have my button still green, so I, could, uh, I want to say a few words about a new journal, um, a relatively new journal, eLife. So eLife was launched about two years ago by um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, um, uh, uh, Max Planck Institute, and then um, well, uh, well, uh, Wellcome Trust in, um, in UK. So, this, um, so, I, so we have submitted papers there, and uh, um, I would say this is, a, this review process was by far the most pleasant ones I have experienced. So it was fast and it was very constructive. I get very, very good feedbacks from a, a, from a, a very consens, a cons, a, a non conflicting reviews, right, from reviewers. And this really helps us to get the papers right, um, out quickly. But now I'm, I'm on the other side of the um, table. So I'm a reviewing editor for, um, for eLife. And I can see the, the extra work an editor had to do to ensure um, this fair and uh, constructive re review process. So as a reviewing editor, I actually personally review every submission that's assigned to me. And I send it to other, I mean, so inevitably I will get the other reviewers, um, other reviews. And inevitably they will conflict, they will contradict each other. And because I have read the paper myself, I'm able to um, synthesize uh, synthesized from all three reviews, and we would, the three reviewers, the identity of which are known to each other, we would have online consultation session. So to determine amongst ourselves, right, what is the, uh, what is the, uh, the most constructive way to help uh, the authors. Um, so then we synthesize, so that as a review editor would synthesize a, a review, which just lists, um, which just lists the minimum things you, uh, the authors must do to get to the papers uh, you know, over the hurdle. So if, you have, if you're curious about this journal, and if you, um, and I just want to say open access and also so far publication free. So if you are, um, and I have seen great, paper, great talks actually from this, uh, from this session, right, published in eLife. So if you have questions about the journal and if you're interested in, uh, in uh, submitting um, your best work to the journal, uh, feel free to talk with me after the, during lunch and after the, after the sessions. Thank you very much.